from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi again. Welcome to the show and happy spring, even if it's 50 degrees cooler than it was a year ago. It's still spring anyway, right? Well, it's been a big week in local news. The other shoe has dropped, and it's a big, oversized, muddy old boot. And just about 70 elementary schools could be closed or so-called turned around, and that means it's going to be the largest ever closing of schools anywhere in the country. And today's show is going to be a place where we will try to ascertain whether such radical medicine is necessary or even wise in the long run, although that's just one of the things we have to talk about because Pension reform has essentially collapsed yet again in the legislature. But despite the simplistic headlines, this is a tough, complicated problem that's been developing over many decades, and it's not going to get resolved without a lot of pain, and it's not going to be fixed with one piece of legislation. So we won't have any answers for you here today either, but we'll talk about it a little bit. But on today's show, we're going to try to take some time to examine the state of housing for people without much money in Chicago. We're not talking about the CHA here. We're talking about the historic multi-unit buildings, usually privately owned, often called single room occupancies, that have been the housing of last resort for so many people for so long in Chicago. They're going away, especially on the north side. And that may be good news for the wealthy people who are moving into some of these areas, but it's very bad for people with very little income who are struggling to keep their lives together. Megan Cottrell joins us today. Last week she won the prestigious Studs Terkel Journalism Award and she's joining us to share some of the stories she heard while she was reporting on this very issue. So we're glad to have you on the show today. And uh, of course we also have with us today Jean Butson who for many years was a player in this field helping to develop hundreds of units of affordable housing and a lot of sparkling new buildings and we'll find out how that is going today. And then rounding out our panel today is our old friend Tom Clark from Community Media Workshop who will help us try to stitch all of this together, be the mortar between the bricks and try to see if there's a connection between pensions, education, housing, Bill Beavers, and whatever. So Tom, We'll try again. Yeah, good luck, good <laughs> luck to us all, right? So Tom, I gotta tell you, we've been hearing for so long that many schools might close and I really I have to admit today that I kind of never believed it. I thought that, you know, the, the big number was like 12 that they had done at one time and, and that uh, Barbara Bird Bennett probably put this special commission together so she could maybe grease 15 or so, you know. But it's going to be 70 with, with turnarounds or maybe more than that. I mean, uh, this, is, this seems almost unbelievable to me. Well, when you move from comprehensive planning to the city of the done deal, when you hollow out neighborhoods that had significant public housing resources that are now torn down, mm -hmm. and the plan for transformation didn't quite replace that housing resource in those neighborhoods or mm -hmm. elsewhere, well, that means a lot of people have been shifted around. And that's really what we're seeing, I think, more than anything else, besides the budget deficit and other issues like mm -hmm. that. There are fewer people in neighborhoods where most of these school closings are going to take place. And um, there wasn't very good planning for that eventuality when you took down all these units of, of uh, uh, public housing, high rises in particular. Mm -hmm. But then the general recessionary impacts on the housing bust has also had an impact on many of these same neighborhoods through foreclosure and other things like that, households doubling or tripling up. Um, and I think as a result, um, the Board of Education, which is facing all sorts of other issues, has suddenly, uh, however you want to accept their overcapacity issue, there clearly has been a movement around a population that has impacted where you put the real where you put the real estate, the infrastructure, what you keep going to serve fewer folks. One of the challenges is that the decisions have been made, as you listen to parents and other school activists, somewhat cookie cutter style has not accommodated special ed classrooms that have naturally smaller classroom size because of the special needs. Um, there's a lot of concerns that the accepting schools are not ready to deal with special ed kids. And so there, there are just all sorts of complications. And when you talk about the scale, not six, not 12, but 50 or 60 schools, uh, not counting turnarounds and new charters that are still gonna come online, mm -hmm. um, 
this is this is sort of a planning mess. I think that would be a good conclusion. This is a sort of a planning mess, and uh, and again, there are there are so many moving parts that contribute to this situation that we're in today. Not the least of which is, as as you point out, the the fact that some of those so-called empty seats aren't necessarily empty seats because they're seats that were just simply moved into charters because we've been opening charters at such a high rate and we're still planning on opening many more of them. So, uh, you know, that number of 100,000 or you know, some rubbery number of 100,000 empty seats has always been to me a kind of a, uh, well, let's just say a rubbery number. I yes. mean, it, because you, you can interpret it any way you want. So I, I, I have to say that I, I just can't quite imagine the impact that this is going to have on a lot of neighborhoods in Chicago. You know, Tom talked about the connection between the plan for transformation and the school closings. One of the schools that is on the chopping block is Jenner School, which is at the center of Cabrini Green. And that is a... Um, a real surprise to me, I guess not a surprise in the fact that Jenner has been doing very poorly for several years and it has been a potential closer for several, several years, but for the residents of Cabrini Green, every single organization resource that they knew when the towers were standing has been stripped away. And Jenner is one, not only um, like the school of the area, but it is the only place that uh, supplies affordable childcare. So parents in Cabrini Green who are CHA residents are required to work 30 hours a week. However, mm -hmm. within the neighborhood, there's no place that accepts childcare vouchers that they can take their kids mm -hmm. um, to, so that, you know, they have to work 30 hours a week, but they don't have someone to watch their kid yeah. 30 hours yeah. a week. And grandma has been moved out to the west side along with auntie and everybody else. Jenner used to have a full day program last year that got cut down, two years ago, it got cut down to a half day. And if that school closes, where are those parents going to take their kids mm -hmm. who are not yet ready mm -hmm. for school, yet they're still required to work? And it just seems so, um, when I'm talking to uh, teachers that work there and people who live in the area, it seems so unjust that every organization that residents knew has been taken away from them mm -hmm. one by one by one. And just how frustrating that is for the com for the community. Not to mention that the school that they're thinking about merging it with would cross gang lines between mm -hmm. North and South Division. And how are you going to deal mm -hmm. with that? You know, that's a very practical question. That you can talk about space. You can talk about hiring more special ed teachers. But you can't solve the gang problem on the street. So how are you going to solve it within a school? You know, can I just say? Um you know, I'm not an expert on education at all, but recently, and I hope you don't mind me m giving this a plug, but Ira Glass did a special on Harper High School, and, and it, it, that special, which was aired on WBEZ, really illustrates your point so nicely, and it really helped me understand just how much more these schools are providing to the families and to the students beyond education, and of course education is important. But these students are relying on these schools for emotional well-being, for their social services, for so much more. And to remove that resource is really catastrophic for so many people. And for me, listening to, the, to that Ira Glass, those specials was really illustrative. It really educated me in a way that I hadn't been before about the importance of maybe not closing some of these places. I agree. I was listening to that on my way and they were rebroadcasting it yeah. this morning. And I was just astounded by how hard those principals and teachers are yeah, working to support astounding. these kids and how incredibly strategic they are about thinking about, okay, we know these kids are part of this gang and these kids are part of this gang and this is gonna be an issue and how do we preserve school and childhood and young adulthood for these kids and also keep them safe. And these, you know, we are often uh, shown the idea of teachers as these lazy people who don't care about yes. anything, who are yes. just, you know, looking for a paycheck. I think mm -hmm. in so many of these schools, you can't work there unless you are uh, incredibly strategic and, and incredibly hardworking. And I've, I've been just taking your resource away. Uh, they're uh, amazing. I, I've been just sickened by the comment boards on in both of our major newspapers the last few days, and and I I just think that we ought to get federal legislation to have them all shut down because <laughs> they're just they're just places for <laughs> ignorant people to make really stupid comments. But. Uh, every time I see one of these things about, you know, it, oh, just that's not enough. Uh, there was I was reading some last night about 75 schools. That's not enough. Shut them all down. Get rid of all these lazy, stupid teachers, and then we'll, you know, then we'll be better off. 
I would just like to grab one of those by the throat, one of those people, and drag them to a school exactly like, like you're saying and say, okay, your new job for the next six months is you're going to teach in this school. Let's see how well you do. Mm -hmm. At 45,000. At 45, yeah, 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 absolutely. Right, right. Oh, yeah. And it's a, it's a full day or whatever they call it. <laughs> what are we calling it now? The, uh, the, the full school day. And one of the things uh, that I, that I want to throw in here, because it's been a kind of a theme on the show here the last couple of weeks, is that these receiving schools, these so-called welcoming schools, mm -hmm. I just can't imagine what it's go what life is going to be like in these schools when suddenly you have 50, 60, maybe a hundred new kids just mm -hmm. pouring into the school. And by definition, they are coming from schools that are quote unquote inferior because you're saying we're going to send you to a quote unquote better, better school, school, right? So you're a parent here. <coughs> it's like, oh, so good, we're getting 100 new kids who are, I don't know, <laughs> they're lesser kids coming from a lesser school. This is going to be really good for our school. I mean, so, okay, so you're going to get some air conditioning, they're going to throw in a library, maybe a few computers. It's not, it, it's not adding up to me, I have to say. And well, and it's not clear that it's really saving very much money at all. And <clears throat> when you look at the indirect costs that uh, might be incurred to the lives of these families, you just, it might actually cost us way more than whatever we might be saving in right, the short right. term. And of course, we've talked many times about the, the cost to a neighborhood of having a blighted, closed, yeah. dark, school hanging out on the corner. Right. Oh, that's just what the neighborhood needs. You think about those welcoming schools, this idea that, oh, well, this school is doing well, so we can just push more kids in here, mm -hmm. not understanding that this school is a delicate ecosystem. If it's doing well, right. it's because the right resources have been put into the right places that, you know, the teachers and the parents and the kids are mm -hmm. working together to make this happen that doesn't that's not just you know oh this is a good school this is a bad school and so if you disrupt that ecosystem you know it's going to be like asian carp or anything like that not to say that those kids are a predator species but that you're disrupting your something right. that right. that is good and mm -hmm. that are you going to preserve mm -hmm. what is going on there and right. you can't say for sure that you are well beginning next week there will be disruptions um, as we saw with the tremendous community support and parent support during the teacher strike, which didn't just happen overnight. There was a lot of organizing activity mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. summer. Uh, Curtis Black of our news tip sheet was covering that pretty Who intensely. needs to get some um, uh, uh, and the credit for that. What's going to happen next week is some more civil disobedience. People mm -hmm. have been training. They are mm -hmm. not going to take the sitting down, so yeah. to speak. And well, you know, it's going to be a significant story the next couple I, of months. I, I think that a, that a major part of <coughs> the, um, the five-year moratorium idea and the, the creation of the commission was to sort of smooth out the public relations thing to just mm -hmm. say, oh, don't worry, we're, we're listening, we're hearing everything you're saying. Well, this listening tour that they held, there were, there were occasions when a thousand people came out to say, hell no, don't close my school. They listened and they did what they wanted and to do. And they discarded. Oh, right, yeah. 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 Okay, so, Megan, you've already done a very good job of, of weaving together the fact that all of our problems are all interconnected. If it's gun violence, it's gangs, it's, it's poverty, it's whatever it is, these things all layer upon one another. And I want to turn, because I'm looking at the clock here, I, we're, I, I just want to make sure we spend enough time today talking about this excellent series of articles that you've done on, on uh, SROs and what's going on in Uptown. And Jean, have you talk a little bit about what you've done, because I've followed your career for many years and you've done some wonderful work on this. There is a perception, I may be wrong about this, but there is a, a, a widely held perception that things have changed significantly in Uptown since the election of Alderman Kappelman. Now that may be grossly unfair, but he appears to be much more receptive to the idea of closing down single room occupancy, not really hotels, they're really not hotels, they're residences and kind of kicking the people out of there so that they can rehab these buildings and make a lot more money with efficiency apartments. Is that terribly unfair? Um, well, 
I, I don't think Alderman Kaplan would characterize it that way. Um, however, no, I, to be fair to <laughs> Alderman Kaplan, he would not characterize it. I that think way. Um, when you ask him about it, one of the things that he said is that there is already a lot of subsidized housing in his ward, and so he doesn't see a need for people necessarily to be relocated if a building is going to close to stay within his ward. I think in he told Mark Brown a couple of weeks ago, well, not everyone can live exactly where they want to live, um, which perhaps is true, but I think most people with a good deal of money can afford to live uh, where, wherever they want to. Um, so yeah, I think that things, things are changing. I mean, the uptown area, just the, that little stretch of Lakeview um, has lost 700 units within the last two years of SRO housing. The northeast side of Chicago, the numbers I've seen is 2,000 units of low-income housing, and that's a significant number. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're talking about a market that's very small, finding these places to begin with is, is very difficult. There are few and far between places that accept this low of rent for people who really make the bare minimum. You, you, you wrote about one, it's not necessarily the, even the most important, but it was it was it became kind of uh, emblematic of all of this. The, the Chateau Hotel. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Well, at the moment, um, uh, the Chateau was purchased back in uh, December by. You should a ask where is the Chateau? Oh, the Chateau is at the corner of Broadway and Sheridan, thirty-eight, thirty-eight North Broadway, um, in sort of Lakeview Uptown border area. And uh, it was purchased back in December uh, by a uh, organization called 3838 North Broadway LLC. We still don't know officially who the owner is. Um, Alderman Kappelman, in fact, knows who the owner is, um, but has told uh, everyone that he has made a promise to the developer not to say who it was. Um, so that's been one thing that residents have been really frustrated about. Who's Alderman are you exactly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that building will be, the lawyer for that organization said it will be gutted, vacated, and rehabbed. Um, and if it goes like many of the other SROs in the area, it will become um, efficiency apartments, but very nice efficiency apartments for, uh, you know, young uh, singles, you know, people who are working in the area who or who work downtown, studio apartments with granite countertops, hardwood floors, stainless steel appliances. Sounds nice. Yes, and double the rent of the current place, mm -hmm. uh, making it just totally unaffordable for the current residents. Well, I mean, that's a terrible thing. I mean, it's really important that we preserve single room occupancy housing because it's the most affordable housing on the market. So if you think of all of our housing being represented by a ladder and every rung of that ladder you go up economically, SROs are the bottom rung of that ladder. And when we remove that rung of that ladder, people don't have anywhere to go except to be homeless and to our shelter system. So if we care about ending homelessness, then we really need to preserve single room occupancy housing. And some of the, the conflict that we see around SROs is somewhat legitimate because so, a lot of it is owned, not a lot, some of it is owned by people who are not very reputable and probably the owner, it sounds like, of the Chateau has not been that great an owner and operator. But that isn't, uh, you know, that isn't really a mystery as to how to do that. when. We ran Lakefront SRO. We were great operators of housing. People welcomed us into the neighborhood. Property values actually increased mm. because we took dilapidated properties, we renovated them, and then we managed them really, really well for very low-income people, and we kept them as single-room occupancy housing. So as, as a society, it's really to our best interest to preserve single-room occupancy housing because otherwise people become homeless. And when people are homeless, they cost society a lot more money than when people are housed in permanent housing and have a roof over their heads. So it's just as simple as that. So it's very short-sighted what the alderman is doing. And, and, and not only, did, I'm sorry, time, just a quick thought. When you were developing these single room occupancies, they also had the benefit of having what would you call it, sort of Services. staffing, service staffing. So we called it supportive housing. So we would actually take people who had been homeless and move them into our housing in addition to preserving housing for people who were already living there. And very often they were people who needed both housing and services in order to maintain housing. So we had case managers whose offices were actually located in the building. Right in the building. And their job was to help the residents access whatever services they might need. It could be 
healthcare services, employment and training, uh, substance abuse treatment in some cases, as we've learned from some of the people at the Chateau. And uh, so the residents would have the services, they would have the housing, and they could deal with the problems in their lives very effectively. And this combination of housing and services was, is viewed as a solution to homelessness and a way to really stabilize these units. And I find it ironic that uh, Alderman Kappelman, a former social worker, wouldn't get this. Um, I think he's probably a. He begins all of his interviews by saying, "I am a former social, social worker." Yeah, but his so actions. I would never do anything wrong. His <laughs> actions speak to his not really fully understanding um, this particular type of housing resource and the importance of it, not just in his neighborhood but around the city. And um, I, I, I think he's taken a line that we used to use uh, maybe 30 years ago when this. Uh, uh, first kind of round of redevelopment was taking place in Uptown. Uptown is where the up and coming meet the down and out. Mm -hmm. um, he seems to be supporting more of those new arrivers as opposed to long-term residents who have found the support systems they need to actually not be on the street, to mm -hmm. be in uh, affordable housing that they hopefully can, can uh, catch up with the rest of their lives with. If they're put back out on the street, we start all over again. As Gene has already pointed out, a much more expensive proposition, both in terms of the impact on those individuals' lives as well as the cost to society. So it's very short-sighted. Something that's really surprised me um, in interviewing Chateau residents is how many of them are actually n not necessarily in need of extra services. So the sort of uh, view is, you know, people do have substance abuse issues, they need all these kinds of extra services, but that because, particularly post-recession, there are a lot of people who are living there who have an education, who have, um, you know, who don't need all kinds of services, who, who are just poor, who just mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. have a low-paying job. There's mm -hmm. a, a woman um, living there right now, she's been really great at organizing the tenants, who used to be a financial planner. And she was laid off from her job. She has a master's degree because she was overqualified, could not get any job. No one wanted to hire her because of what she would cost to employ and was evicted from her apartment. And so now can't get any other place to live, be, even though she has a job, because she has an eviction on her record. She works for a homeless shelter in Uptown, mm -hmm. and she says one of her biggest fears is that she's going to see her neighbors as her clients um, in within just a few weeks. So we have some people, yes, that are definitely in need of supportive housing, who are in need of, of, of some pretty significant services, but we have other people who are really have just sort of fallen through the cracks um, and, you know, the recession is, is still really with many of them. You know, let me just say something. I have to say this this fight has been going on in Uptown for at least 40 or 50 uh, yeah, years. Yeah. And, it, and in part it's happened because Uptown has this very diverse um, housing stock. Mm -hmm. So it's got the single room occupancy housing efficiencies and so on, as well as the um, Lake Lakeshore Drive high rises and very expensive condominiums and so on and the historic districts, it's got all of this. Mm -hmm. And everybody is trying to live together. And, and we always thought of it as um, really a strength, the diversity as a strength, if we can learn how to have, you know, well-managed housing stock mm -hmm. at whatever level, you know, it could be. But because it's kind of built into the genes of the community that you got all this diversity, Poor people are going to be attracted to Uptown. They're going to keep coming to that affordable housing. And to actually tear it down or, con or significantly renovate it so that it can't be low-income housing is uh, a pretty mammoth undertaking in one sense. You know, I mean, it really is fundamentally changing the nature of the community from what it's been for a long time. And I think that's what the alderman is not really understanding about the history of the community. And instead of fighting it, if you could actually work with it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. see, it see it as, as something benefit. that, you know, to work with instead of against. But uh, I guess it really, we have to spend a moment or two as we come to the end of the show here. There are lots of people watching this, I'm sure, and, and there is a general sense that, oh yeah, it's, it's easy for and all of you who don't live in Uptown to, to look at this community and say, they need to keep all those poor people in there, but you don't have them in your community. I'm not, I don't mean you specifically, mm -hmm. but you know, there are, I, the community that I live in is pretty much the bungalow belt. So this is not an issue where I live. And I could imagine that it could be. 
And I don't know, I mean, obviously this is, as you say, this is a battle that's just been going on for decades. And it looks now like maybe the balance is shifting, but it's shifting because there are a lot of people in Uptown who are wealthy, are people of means, and are seeing this as something, this is a problem that needs to be cleared out. Well, a complicating factor is that around the northeast side, we've had a lot of rental uh, housing stock pre-recession that was converted to condos. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are now uh, creating a significant uh, short sale mm -hmm. dynamic yeah, in yeah, those yeah, same yeah. neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They have not returned to rental. The, the market value of those underwater condos uh, don't speak to affordable rents, if, even if an owner wanted to go mm -hmm. to it. So we have, the, the, the market's been thrown off by both the loss of rental housing generally, mm -hmm. then the recession impacting the value of that housing, and now we have kind of a new effort to kind of surge, particularly in Uptown, because there's a whole mm -hmm. another controversy around the redevelopment of the former uh, hospital, the Maryville sure. site, sure. Um, which is also one of these uh, 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 curious examples where a developer is looking for some public participation to make mm -hmm. his market rate deal work. Mm -hmm. um, now that's not taking over affordable housing, but it is one of these pressures mm -hmm. in sort of heating up that local marketplace where um, I think we had attained a level of diversity and acceptance of that as an asset, mm -hmm. as a place that mm -hmm. was a good place for people to live, and now that's being really so thrown So that's off. an interesting, th that is actually an interesting point that you make, is that the, the, um, the financial dynamic is changing that's making it much more uh, palatable or, or, or attractive for a developer to go in and, and acquire one of these buildings mm -hmm. and turn it into granite countertops and hardwood floors. And maybe that's where we need to make the point that I think Mayor Daly really saw and understood through a lot of work that these units are very important to the city of Chicago mm -hmm. regardless of what community they're in and we need to protect them. And we did a lot of work to change the zoning code and the building code to protect single room occupancy housing and Mayor Emanuel needs to learn this lesson as well. We cannot lose these units. Yeah, they are yeah. valuable assets just let to the, the market whole de city. De determine everything. That's it, right. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's a lack of understanding, um, even within the diversity. Like Jean said, the problem is management. It's not that these buildings are inherently uh, troublesome, but that when you have someone who's not particularly invested in that building, who isn't making the upgrades either physically or you know doing the sort of social work that needs to be done to mm -hmm. make sure this building mm -hmm. works, that's really what needs to change. Mm -hmm. These buildings can be problematic, but they don't have to be right. problematic. And the, I think the idea is right now, well, we'll just get rid of the building and you'll get rid of the problem. Get rid of the problem, yeah, yeah. We have pretty much run out of time here, but Megan, what, what's the absolute latest on, on the chateau? Is there? Well, there's actually a protest tonight um, at Alderman Kaffelman's office. Um, at the moment, the building is not gonna be shut down for housing violations, but residents are just sort of waiting um, on tender hooks, not knowing when they're gonna be evicted. The building has stopped accepting rent, oh, wow. and so they could uh, legally evict the tenants pretty much at any time. And there's about 70, 75 people living there right now who are um, staying there as long as they can. Okay, that's the update on that. Gene Butson, thanks so much for Thank being with you, us Ken. today. Megan Cottrell, always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. And Tom Clark, our old friend. Great to be here again, Kay. Great to have you back. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It is a community service of CAN TV. You can watch our program anytime you like, but you can go to this address on the internets and you can uh, watch it on your, you know, your device, whatever your device is, anytime you want. I'm Ken Davis saying thanks so much for watching us and we'll see you right back here again, whether you like it or not, next week on Chicago Newsroom. Thanks, bye.